the story of Ethiopia's great monarch modernizer and tragic hero Haile Selassie starts in the thousand-year-old city of Harer. It was here in Harer that Rastafar, as he was known before his coronation as emperor, cut his political teeth. It also serves as a strong symbol of the difference between the ancient but primitive feudal society he grew up in and the modern nation he wanted to build. As a UNESCO World Heritage Site, Herrera cannot construct new buildings within the old city's walls. But new buildings do go up outside the old city, and technology creeps in from all directions. So the coming year is holy war. I mean, like, hopeful, no war, no problems. Jeff Pierce is a Canadian author who has spent 10 years working on a book about the country's war with Italy. In his decade of research, he has interviewed some of the top experts on Ethiopian history. Emperor Haile Selassie, of course, he had a special connection to Harar, and he invested in coffee plantations. He was very shrewd financially, um, but he was also very politically astute. These were the rules of King Haile Selassie. So these are medals which are gotten from different countries. Haile Lugasho is a tour guide who has taught himself four languages and shows visitors around Haile Selassie's honeymoon palace in Harer. That's a very young Ras Mulligan. Yes, I think. Haile Selassie's time, actually, I was like too young for that, and my family used to mention that he's one of a good leader. And everything is, the main reason what they mention is everything is very peaceful, and most of the things are very cheap. They have been brought together by the man, dead almost four decades, who tried to bring together his nation his continent and the world, often with his own personal touch. The most unique uh, habit of King Haile Selassie is not only present, pretending like a king and always staying in the palace. So my grandfather used to tell me that he always go to a place where people get sick, like in the hospitals, and visit people. And people who don't have finance, they are supported by King Haile Selassie. So he's a really nice king in my opinion. Rastafar was the son of nobleman Ras Makonen, a provincial governor. He was also an Ethiopian hero for fighting off invading Italians in the late 1800s. Ras Makonen is buried in this Harer church in a place of honor. His compatriots who died repelling the Europeans are buried underneath the church. His father decided to educate young Rastafar with tutors of different specialities, one an Ethiopian monk and the other a Mexican surgeon. Ras Makonen had two sons. Upon his death in 1908, his eldest, Yilma, inherited the post. Two years later, he also passed away and Rastafar became governor while still a teenager. If you want to understand the Ethiopian sort of feudal politics, is it was really like Game of Thrones. <laughs> it really was. C imagine this boy who's a duke, and he is given responsibilities to run this province at 14 years old. And he's trained by a Catholic priest. He's not trained by an Orthodox Ethiopian <laughs> cleric. So already the other nobles are suspicious of this kid. At 24, he was appointed regent by Empress Zeoditu, who used the young man to solidify her own hold on power due to his influential family. This made Rastafar heir to the throne, but he would have to survive some challenges to become emperor. When there was a rebellion against him, 
sometime around when he was regent and uh, soon to become emperor, he was, a, he was a fan of flight. And he got a plane, <laughs> and they bombed and machine gunned the rebels. So you had these guys with spears and antique rifles and spears and shields coming out. And here's this biplane coming over, bombing you. Well, that ends that. Eventually, the Empress passed on, and it was time for him to take the throne. This moved him from Harer, through the Ethiopian countryside, to the new capital of Addis Ababa. At that time, we couldn't assume the buildings. There are huts, different kinds of huts. And a very big uh, house, maybe one commander of the army, the other low-level commanders, they built their huts around his uh, home, around 11,000 people in Addis Ababa. And there is no uh, road, you see, uh, and nobody uh, can assume that. Therefore, when Ali Selassie came to uh, the power, very big uh, buildings were churches. While Addis was still primitive, the new emperor had big plans and decided to build a world-class palace that would impress Ethiopians and foreign visitors alike. This palace, also it was built after his coronation in 1934. In 1934, with 800 workers and eight months. His palace is now part of a museum on the ground of the country's first university, which he himself founded. His visits with students showed the early priority he was putting on modernizing education in Ethiopia. He used to visit many schools throughout the whole uh, Ethiopia. He was encouraging students to learn. He was even giving us incentives by giving a small amount of money. Uh, he used to give us sweater and so on and so forth. So he was encouraging us to learn. I grew up in uh, sort of in his family's schools. You know, I started with his grand grandson's school, and then his son, McConnell, and then went to his another grandson in person. I had the opportunity once or twice to meet him. Haile Selassie wanted young people who could do more than just read or write, who would become diplomats, scientists, engineers. But he had to start with the basics. I think I must have been seven or eight years old and we lined up to meet him and that's the first time I saw him and he gave us 50 cents each and I value that money that's the money I used to buy the first pencil and the first uh, uh, writing pad the young emperor's passion for education would eventually bear fruit but in the early years it was opposed by the nobility that Rastafar had come from here, Al used to give gifts on Christmas Day to the students going to school. Uh, in those days, the feudal system and the, uh, well, they call them now reactionaries, but the truly conservative people uh, didn't want their children to be uh, going to school and uh, get contaminated by Western culture. But Haile Selassie was desperate to have um, educated people for, for his administration, for his services. And uh, even the children 
the, you know, the, the, it is the servant's children that they sent to school. And uh, his first ministers were composed of uh, uh, mostly commoners, uh, not from the nobility. In order to push forward his agenda for modern education, he needed to win over this nobility, which he did by supporting tradition. Haider Sinasi is a very good diplomat. He was also conservative. He tried to keep the tradition uh, of Ethiopian people and the tradition of the monarchy to keep his hierarchy. Uh, and he tried also uh, to keep uh, the throne. To unify the country and have everyone support his modern ideas, he would need to earn the loyalty of those from the country's other 80 tribes. Ethiopia is a federal state. There are 83 ethnic groups who represent 83 ethnic groups. Perhaps King Haile Selassie from three ethnic groups, Amara, Oromo, and Gurage or Sindhi. Therefore, what I was arrest, 83 ethnic groups, not easy. Eight ethnic, ethnic groups, they have their own culture, their tradition, their belief, even their traditional uh, kings, they have it. Perhaps the most crucial factor that helped him to unify the country and gain acceptance for his modernization program was the support of the powerful Ethiopian Orthodox Church. <laughs> Upon his coronation, he was renamed Haile Selassie, in the Amharic language, Power of the Trinity. As emperor, he became the head of the Orthodox Church, and by tradition, had a religious right to rule. Before 1974, just the state and the religion, it was linked. Who coronated King Haile Selassie? By the church. That's why I said it. The churches, because the churches, it was belonging to for the king. Is more dominant. You cannot separate the churches and the kings. And uh, also they have a power. They were also, uh, also one third of the land was belonged to for the churches. Of course, for us, you know, we, 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 we think he's like, like God, uh, you know. And uh, he himself did not give us that coin, by the way. It's Abhanna, his, his treasurer, who goes out and hunts coin, and our eyes are with him. You know, a very short fellow, walking, and, uh, you know, that, that's it. You know, you can imagine at that age, <laughs> we thought God was on earth. While he was promoting an agenda based on logic and progressive ideas, legend was a powerful tool of the church. It claims a biblical relationship between its monarch and the famous Jewish leader and legendary wise man, King Solomon. The Ethiopian royal line, so Haile Selassie himself, is said to descend directly from the Queen of Sheba. I, for one, it's very difficult to justify that Haile Selassie was a direct descendant of Haile Selassie and Queen Sheba, uh, Queen Sheba and uh, King Solomon. But we simply took it for granted, for we love and respect in Haile Selassie. It was before Christ, 955 BC. And while she was traveled to Israel, and she was a beautiful woman, and she was asleep with him. While she came to Ethiopia, she was pregnant and born Milik first after nine months and five days. While Haile Selassie disavowed the legend to educated friends and foreigners, it was part of the powerful hold he had over the common people. The emperor's religious authority would seem to make it easy to unify the nation, but he decided to use his personal touch to make people believe in his love for his country and its people. He, he was everywhere in Ethiopia. He was with car, with car. Sometimes with uh, helicopter, for example, 1965. He was with uh, Queen Elizabeth in Gondor, in Erte uh, Gondor, Eritrea. Even they were camping in Gondar, Gondar city, we were almost 40 kilometers far from Gondar, and they were camping. Christian begins everything. Then Saleh, Asbara, Gondar, Dredoa, Bajuma, Gondar, which I got a little bit, I kept the under water. I got it. But I'm told that Marina both. 
በዩሮፓ ቋንቋ ፖፑላር እንደሚባለው በጣም ተወዳጅ መሪ ነበሩ ህዝቡ ታሪካቸውን ያምናል አሰራራቸውን ያምናል መሪነታቸውን በትልቅ ደስታ ተቀብለዋል እና አሁን ድረስ ስማቸው የገነነ ነው በእያለበት በነይት በነጠይቅ በናይ በዛን ዘመን የነበረና የሚያውቃቸው ይወዳቸዋል His accessibility also showed he had an open mind something that helped him learn from his people and change with the times The other encounter was uh, when I was in civil aviation school very funny I had a girlfriend and in those days you know if you have a girlfriend it has to be very very secretive so we were asked walking her home and we made sure that we would not encounter her brother so we took a small alley and so we were walking taking our time chatting in you no know, car and all of a sudden we heard a small knock on uh, on the horn we turned around it was emperor we saw the flag i pulled her out and we bowed i will never forget it he looked at me laughing and he said i saw you <laughs> these are my my encounters actually iza hulet bazoch chikokorochu china china la ያው ህዝብ እንደሚሰራቸው አይደለም አይደለም በኛ ወግል ደግሞ ጌሴ ነው ብሎ እንጂ ይቅርብ አገር ጋር ነው ማለት ጌሴ ለልል ይችላል ነው while he spent a lot of time cultivating popularity with his ethiopian subjects he also courted international favor he was a famous diplomat and uh, a lot of countries had a very good relation with him uh, african countries uh, europe or also america he was everywhere almost 2600 something 2700 times he was visiting the 14 province during his time at that time it was 14 uh, province and then he was visiting 167 countries in the world occasionally there was criticism well his detractors would say he's going there to have fun uh, but i am sure it's for diplomatic uh, purposes that he went uh, he would go to america meet kennedy or uh, eisenhower i think he had more than both uh, uh, he i don't think he would just chai and, and and come back he would come with Uh, programs of aid and uh, projects of one sort of, uh, or another the emperor learned about modern ideas and technology bringing home worldly knowledge and friendships agar emihedut janoy andum lagaritu wodaj lemafrat be international guday lay tawabro lemasrat ሲሆን ሁለተኛው ደግሞ ኢትዮጵያን በይበልጥ ለማስተዋወቅ ነው Haile Selassie anticipated globalization even on the modest scale of the 1930s In 1923 he signed Ethiopia up to be the first African country to join the League of Nations the forefather of the United Nations I decided to come myself to defend the cause of my people before the council of the league of nations i hope that the council will be good enough to excuse me from reading the whole of my declaration he saw his country being pulled between the development of an industrialized europe and its place in its own still wild continent of africa he would send young ethiopians very talented young intelligentsia off to the capitals of europe to get an education because he recognized that the country had to modernize his initial choice appeared to be to lean toward europe there he mined ideas that would help build ministries schools and institutions that were aimed at taking ethiopia from a primitive feudal state to a modern nation ramasilasi amararacho አስተዳደራቸው የተመሰረተው ኢትዮጵያን በዘመናዊ ስልጣኔ 
እንድትጠቀም ለማድረግና በአዲስ መልክ ለመምራት ነው In 1931 he became the first absolute ruler to voluntarily write a constitution which established a judicial system while still keeping most of the power of government in the emperor's hands until uh, 1974 he showed different kinds of developments in the country we couldn't uh, deny this kinds of uh, uh, changes in the first constitution or written in his uh, more key time the second constitution uh, also improved by uh, his uh, power time he tried to bring Ethiopia to civilization to, to, to civilize the society but um, how far uh, he, he tried to to, to 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 bring this country it is it, it has its own uh, limitation and the Sinasi was highly interested uh, to have many modern uh, modern scholars in Ethiopia to change to bring fundamental change in terms of civilization and development as well his early efforts to modernize his country through education had only 6 years to progress before tragedy struck in 1936 fascist italy decided once again to be the first european colonizers of ethiopia The entire world was fascinated by this war. It was on the New York Times, it was in the London Times. 20,000 black Americans were marching in Harlem over this war. There are battleships in the Mediterranean about to go to war with Italy over this war, and it was a precursor to the Second World War. It had a huge impact on world events. The emperor tried to use his connections to head off the Italian attack. He delivered an impassioned speech to the League of Nations pleading for the world's interference. The jeers of fascists in the gallery did not stop him. I am here to claim justice, he said. What reply shall I take back to my people? So said the emperor, it is us today, it will be you tomorrow. Ramai sila se bazar bota hedo rasa cho, yeto pias keh guci bete gawenya diktator menyal gifun desas pasang pet bami gaba asra detawan, an de nugu senagas. We mind Mary, but then the man he do, the League of Nations forum lay when Shangolai, I will to tie a car over, cause I just will tell them. Our emperor also made a very remarkable and prophetic speech. He said to them, "It is we today and you tomorrow." After which all the Europeans are fallen under the strongest and brutal heel of Hitler. So it was the kind of prophecy that had already taken place. His eloquence, moral authority, and logic fell on deaf ears. Despite the League's refusal to intervene, he continued to hope that the strength of his people and the righteousness of their position would defeat the Italians. It is good that you are here to record this picture of me in my palace garden at Addis Ababa. People who see this throughout the world we realize that even in the 20th century with faith courage and the just cause david will still beat goliath the italians hit harer his youthful stronghold Mussolini's planes bombed this city. They wiped out the oldest mosque in Africa, and few people know about it. But uh, there was no military installations here. They just decided, let's scare the living daylights out of uh, of the Hararis. And uh, Emperor Haile Selassie, of course, he had a special connection to Harar, and and he was very uh, hurt. But you know, he was very emotionally moved by the plight of the people here. Eventually the Italians took the capital burning his palace and shocking Ethiopians with their targets they killed 
more than 300 uh, priests and monks. It retarded the country. The Italians under Mussolini massacred an entire generation that could have led this country into the 20th and 21st century. Haile Selassie went into exile in Bath, England in 1936. He nearly died there practically of pneumonia and sickness because it was so cold he wasn't used to the climate. He came back here and I believe it affected his character deeply that he was never going to give up control and never going to divest control to other people. For five long years the Emperor suffered in tough conditions in damp cold weather until 1941. Once the Italians were chased out by Ethiopian freedom fighters operating from the countryside, he was welcomed home to reclaim his throne and once again try to unite and modernize Ethiopia. We had the most difficult time with him uh, when the Italian invasion, for example, Ethiopia had never been invaded by any enemy. It had been always a uh, free uh, land, uh, the freedom fighter and uh, these people defended their country five years was in his time and he was lucky enough to actually regain the freedom and uh, helped many of the African nations to get their freedom too and so he was really a very special uh, God gifted person. But his time away from home had given him some valuable perspective and he would return with a plan on how to build a new Ethiopia and how to try and empower Africa so it could look after its own. The pillars he would build his modern Ethiopia on would be people, educators, cultural heroes, diplomats, engineers and mechanics, and even pilots. To try and connect Africans, he would build an airline and use his wisdom, charm and diplomatic experience to move Africa forward toward an era of independence and unity. The Emperor's first order of business was to create an educated class of young people who could power his country forward with their intelligence and ability to adapt to new ideas in a rapidly developing world. He started with two schools, one for secondary students and one for university pupils. He made education his priority. As a matter of fact, for many, many years, he could not trust anybody else. He himself was Minister of Education. For many years. He took it. In, I tell you, this is why he used to come in every boarding school. He was like our father, bring fruits and so on. Now, but Murtabakul, the Telayim Rasa Cho, Kahaya Amatat Balai, yet Murt Minister Natun Sultanizo Agaruni Marusel and a Berre, Murt Mister Nimarusel and a Berre, Bazu yet Murt Wat Atoch Afretal. Today, there are hundreds of secondary schools throughout the nation and over 150 colleges or universities. So this was really something that uh, in different subjects he was always interested in seeing and helping people and education and so on. He was the Minister of Education himself to educate all of us actually to bring us to this level unless we forget whatever he has done. Uh, so these are his products I would say. 
from 1855 up to 1974. Yes, this is the modern history of Ethiopia. Is that clear? Haile Selassie's crusade to create a brilliant team of young achievers helped steer his nation to where it is now. Modern education is his legacy. The other thing is that not just education, but excellence in education. He quickly grew local educators to replace foreigners. And here was a place to start his Pan-African leadership. In 1958, he invited 200 African students to Ethiopia to study at Haile Selassie University, now called Addis Ababa University. He wished to transfer his dream of modern education to the rest of Africa, but he also saw the need to engage others to promote Ethiopia's role on the continent. By bringing European diplomats, scholars and tourists to Ethiopia, he also saw a way to increase his countrymen's exposure to new ideas and develop international trade partners. But he needed to make sure they appreciated his nation. This is your first ambassador in Ethiopia. So he turned to some of the young Ethiopians he was building his contemporary society on, including Habde Selassie Tafese. Oh, I could see him any day. He was very kind with me. The emperor sent him off to Germany on Ethiopian Airlines' first flight there. He came back with some ideas on tourism. That was the first inaugural flight Ethiopian Ethiop Airlines to Frankfurt. Big deal. And uh, in the process, the Germans were talking about tourism. The emperor instructed him to get a tourism operation going. The emperor called me. He said, you have to do this job. I said, your majesty, I know nothing about this job. He told me, try. That reward I remember. Try. It's like an order. <laughs> Camouflage order. <laughs> So I said, okay. Haile Selassie was always helpful in the efforts to impress foreigners, dignitaries, or ordinary tourists. If I go there, I tell my tourists, he said, bring them. I bring 10, 50, 30 tourists to him. He orders champagne. He orders tedge. He gives them to drink. They take, take a picture together, take a picture with the tame lion, and visit he allowed us to visit the palace here in front. Tourists went, took pictures, I went around, looked around, even his bedroom. After a few years of bringing in groups of foreigners and shooting photos all over the country, Habte Selassie coined the country's famous tourism slogan. I'm surprised you didn't ask me about the slogan, 13 months of sunshine, I coined for Ethiopia. Oh, okay. It has a meaning. First of all, it's your pay 13 months of calendar. And then there is sunshine 13 months a year. <laughs> Anytime. The rainy season, rain comes. All of us know that after 15 minutes, sun will come out. Ethiopia uses what they call the gaze calendar, which is seven years difference from the commonly used Gregorian calendar and also breaks the year down into 13 months. Another area that enjoyed the Emperor's personal touch was culture, and in particular, theatre. Right over there where that bench is, it's the emperor and the queen were sitting right there. Actor Haimanot Alemu remembers when he was nine years old and the emperor came to see a play at his school. He had come to see a play and uh, he brought the queen and they both sat s sort of where you are now. And uh, the play was Moliere's The Miser. Excellent actor, Makona Dori was so good. 
And uh, so I sat there, and uh, half the time I wasn't watching the play, I was watching the emperor. And uh, I saw the play, it looked uh, simple, it looked like a simple thing to do on stage, enough to bring an emperor to our school. And that's when I decided that I want to be an actor, and never changed my mind since. Hymenot's career blossomed with encouragement from the emperor and the occasional scolding. The emperor came. And uh, I played the Italian collaborator, which is a character everybody loved to hate. And I have a very bad monologue where I really slam Ethiopia and Ethiopians. And he walked, he walked out of the theater and went to the palace. Then the three actors and the playwright were called to the palace and was, were given a, a dressing down. He was really upset. Tesfaya Gassese was also fortunate to have the emperor take notice of him. He was training to be a lawyer when Haile Selassie caught him performing. I was um, nervous when he came, but still I guess I was good enough to <laughs> convince him it was a, a good performance. Called me in the morning to his palace, gave me his watch, asked me what uh, my plans were. I said, I'm going to go and study law. He said, uh, I asked the minister beside him, how many students are going to study law? I think he answered 12. 12? Oh, that's quite a lot. So we have very many lawyers under <laughs> training. We need someone in the theater. Yeah, uh, I said, there they... Uh, administrators of the theater, the managers and directors were white people. They didn't speak Amharic, the, the, the local language. And so he needed you know, Ethiopians to replace them. So he said, it was a sort of an order that you go and study theater. Uh -huh. I graciously accepted it and I don't, <laughs> I don't regret it at all. I'm very happy with the, with the profession. And when I'm a professor, he ended up as the manager of the National Theatre, as well as starring in countless performances. His favorite was Hamlet. I played Hamlet also okay, for the Emperor. That's another great play. That was the first Hamlet. Uh, I had uh, well, what we call first Ethiopian premieres by our prominent, later on prominent playwrights were staged by me. Haile Selassie stayed interested in Ethiopian theater throughout his life. See, after him, that's what we missed. There were no leaders on, you know, on, uh, to see our productions. But he did attend uh, comedies or historical plays or um, tragedies. Uh, he, he did. And uh, even before the Italian invasion and the establishment of proper theaters in the country, he. Uh, used to invite people who wrote dialogues or pieces of theater to his palace for when his children got married for, from wedding parties uh, and things like that. And he gave prizes to the writers and to the actors. Uh, so he was a great uh, benefactor of the arts, a patron of the, of the theater and uh, the arts. Despite his pressing duties as head of state, his personal touch was always felt. The general populace worshipped him. And so you can imagine uh, him coming here and we small actors <laughs> being honored by his presence. He usually also stayed late after the show and shook hands with us and said, well, good, and, and, and left. After Ethiopia suffered at the hands of the Italian Air Force during the 1930s occupation, one might guess that the Emperor might have wanted one of his own for defensive purposes.
but he started Ethiopian Airlines for different reasons. Number one was to connect his own country, which has very difficult terrain to cross. See, this is what I really call the emperor, the emperor's wisdom. After independence, he really wanted to modernize this country, this nation. And all the provinces were far apart. And he knew the only way to connect these provinces will, will not be possible by road because of the mountains and the currents, it's totally damn expensive. So he chose airplanes and they succeeded. He also saw the airline as a way to link Africa with Ethiopia as its center. And that really put the nation together. Yeah. And gradually, we wanted to extend this to the rest of Africa. And uh, also, we were very, very sure in the planning that since we are far apart from the rest of the world, we have to be independent. So we started our maintenance right away. While the early days at Ethiopian Airlines were tough financially, the effort paid off in more ways than one. The OE was started. There was no other flight than us connecting the nation. And I remember, I forgot the date now, IATA came up, but before IATA, Every airline used to pay the tickets he wants to sell, for whatever price he wants to quote. Then I attack him, prices were regulated. All major airlines of the world were broke. Ethiopian airlines made money. In 2012, the company made a profit of 42 million US dollars. Connected to the rest of the world and Africa by air, Haile Selassie now became Africa's biggest champion, uniting the continent through the Organization of African Unity, or OAU. <laughs> He wanted to move the continent forward in terms of trade and security to help everyone progress. He saw an opportunity to lead a post-colonial Africa from Addis Ababa to show them how a modern independent African nation could achieve great things. Ethiopia has never been occupied by the way. For five years, Italians say we are their colonies, but they were able to monitor only the towns. All the other countryside was controlled by the freedom fighters, Arbeni, what you call them. And because of that, because our independence for centuries, we felt responsible to lead the rest of Africans, you know, to come to that standard. Because they are new. They do not have actually governments like us in history. There was 33 uh, leaders of uh, the African nations, which has united for the first time. And this was his luck. And uh, he's regarded as the father of the, uh, of the other African nations as well. Many of Africa's independence leaders went to the emperor for inspiration, advice, and even material support. Such men as Kwame Nkrumah, Jomo Kenyatta, Julius Nyerere, Kenneth Kaunda, and even Nelson Mandela. Many of them, they were really giving him recognition for what he had done. And we are like Kenyatta, 
and many others i mean like to kroma ay zare besafu neger lachal tawqol lachal sacho ya african andnet lememesret bezian zemen keneburut meriyoch gara yetenegageru yetesmamu badis awa katama lay kafteñaw sebseba ndidderegna ye afrika andnet charteru ndiferem we had a good appreciation about pan africanism and eventually when the au was established in 1963 and black and white television was introduced for the first time so it was a very exciting time so was, uh, the kind of the emperor i think kind of built in this appreciation of what was happening in the rest of the continent in our young minds The OAU found a home in Addis Ababa, in part because Ethiopian Airlines could bring Africa's new leaders together here. <laughs> Having just celebrated its 50th anniversary and now called the African Union, the organization boasts many achievements achievements that would make the emperor proud. They include ending white minority rule in southern African nations, helping to create a new nation in South Sudan, and promoting stability in Somalia. Haile Selassie took a personal interest in promoting peace between African neighbors. His airline would prove to be crucial to his ability to go to flashpoints where his diplomatic skills would achieve dramatic results. I remember one incident, I think 1965-66, I'm not sure of the date. Two nations were at the brink of war, Morocco and Algeria, I think. They have their troops they are already, the emperor was there, to the front line. We took him with the 720B. And I remember, there was no jet start, you know, a car that used the, the, the pressure to start the engine. So until the emperor negotiated, we kept one engine running for six hours. And we brought peace. That's what he did. Everywhere there is a problem, he used to go there and venture. And that continued, and that was what brought Africa really to what it is. His jetting off to solve other people's problems didn't keep him from paying attention to his own family. With six children from his wife, Queen Menen, Haile Selassie had a large family to be concerned about. He wrote about how he handled his families, how he related with his wife and their different social advice. Based on that uh, advice, he wrote to his son. Uh, this is uh, my dear wife, with uh, Arnold, who is his, his her grandfather, Magister Nasi. Various family members held positions in provincial governments, such as his grandson-in-law, Prince Mengesha Seyum. He was the first far-sighted person and. Uh, it was very easy for him to understand us whenever we brought problems. Of course, as a minister, I was one uh, who was very near to His Majesty. But he didn't let his relatives take outsized positions in his administration or lineup of advisors. His family, Yarasa Beta Savo Chacho, Besra Gudda, I go. And then. ስራላይ የተካፈሉ ይኖራሉ ነገር ግን እኔ ያ ነው ይዘመኔ እኔ ያ ነው ልጅ ቤተሰብ ነኝ ብሎ ባንዳንድ አገሮች እንደታየው ስልጣን አልታየ he was worried about his wife health but as far as i know from that letter their relation was very good In 
In the 1960s, his family would feel significant pain with the death of Queen Menen. It was a loss that the emperor would feel at home every day. Aware of his own mortality, he kept a thorough exercise regime and a consistent diet. He had uh, an exercise, he had some weight lifting, everything. He was in good shape. Perhaps at this time he was too focused on building industries and relations with his neighbors. He didn't hear the drumbeat of socialism's growing popularity across the world, in Africa and at home. Ethiopia's land titles still largely belonged to the nobility and students wanted that changed. And a new socialist movement called the Derg eventually seized power and changed the system. Even many of the emperor's supporters were jubilant when land reform was realized. The feudal system controlled all the land, 3,000 gashas, and they're not working on it. See to you. So we're eager to see that. In fact, there was a demonstration way back at the University College. Maret Larash was a slogan. Let land go to the tiller. Although I had a lot of land, I lost three gashas of land, but I want it gone because I'm not there, I'm not farming. So when the derg came and announced that one, me and my brother-in-law, eight hours who have been jumping around, I decided I'm being happy because that was justice. It must have stopped there. But things continued. You know, we're not politicians, we're just... That was the idea, being fair. But the new regime would target the monarchy. We knew that they arrested him. He was somewhere around us because they kept records there. They brought all the records and looked. Nothing, my name, nothing I got. I will, be, I will not be alive now to talk to you. <laughs> Haile Selassie's family members either fled or were jailed as many were associated with his regime. My wife and my mother-in-law and uh, Princess Saragda, the other princesses who were, who were the four sisters of my wife. My wife was caught and I went to Sudan instead. And so I became the freedom fighter there. And uh, while the other families have been detained here for 14 years. I was eight years in prison with 56 counts. And uh, Said eight years there. The first uh, few days, they came in, they said, we'll judge you according to the law. The emperor himself received the ultimate punishment. Some used to say he was shot poisoned, suffocated, but we don't have any confirmation concerning the way how he died. Haile Selassie's greatest sin, his greatest mistake was living too long. When the current regime eventually overthrew the Derg in 1991, Haile Selassie's body was eventually discovered in a basement and was enshrined in the National Cathedral in a tomb next to his wife, Queen Menen. Here we have uh, two historical tombs. This one belongs to Emperor Haile Selassie and that one belongs to his wife, Empress Menen. She died of natural cause 50 years ago. Gone but not forgotten, people will continue to look back on the remarkable life 
of Ethiopia's modern emperor.